Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we speak to Richard Skinner, who is the director of the fiction programme at the Faber Academy. So the Faber Academy is one of an increasing number of creative writing programmes that are not in a university context, rather run by other institutions, in this case a publisher. It's been going on for about 10 years uh, and has a impressive record of, of getting publication deals for its graduates, although Richard would say that's, that's not the be-all and end-all. Uh, we asked him about what the programme involves and also put to him some of the common uh, criticisms that are levelled at this sort of programme and he gave some very interesting responses. We hope you enjoy it. So we're here uh, with Richard Skinner, who is the director of the fiction programme at the Faber Academy. Um, Richard, great to have you on the show. Can you you, you tell us a bit, um, just really about your own background as a writer and and what you were doing before you started the job that you had? Yeah, so I guess, um, like many writers, I did an English degree, uh, didn't have any plans or, or idea of what I was going to do, drifted a bit, um, lived abroad for a while teaching English as a foreign language, did that in London as well and in um, 1995 when I was 30 I um, applied for a place at UEA on the MA Creative uh, Writing Programme and to my utter astonishment I got a place. Um, I really wasn't expecting to, I, I used it really just as a a deadline to try and get some writing done and <clears throat> you know I thought I'd send it off just to see what happened but I got this place and I was just gobsmacked and um, so I spent the year there um, <clears throat> I was too broke to to move to Norwich so I commuted by coach to Norwich which I wouldn't uh, ever recommend so it's, it's a horrible drive up there and back anyway um, did that for a year and really that was when I started to take myself sort of seriously as, as uh, in terms of maybe becoming a writer and um, it really that was the first step on my path towards trying to to be a writer as a form of living and I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't go back to my old job which I didn't and I've been managing one way or another um, uh, including sort of years and years of being completely broke, of course, um, to, to survive as a writer in some shape or form. How much writing had you considered or, or had done before the course, and how did the course um, shape, shape your writing? I'd always written poetry. Um, you know, I was writing poetry when I was a teenager. And all throughout my 20s, I was writing poetry and I was kind of sending it off to places, competitions, magazines and getting the odd one in here and there and third place in a competition Mm. and so on. But in my mid to late 20s, I really hit a wall with poetry and I just didn't know if I was doing anything that was any good. And in those days, it was was harder to find writing groups and, you know, places to show your work and people to share your work with. And so I, I switched to prose, and I hadn't really done much prose at all um, up to then. So I just wrote some pieces. I remember writing some pieces about Talking Heads, the band, and about Tolstoy, uh, and things like that. They were really sort of mini essays and, and uh, bits and pieces, and that's what I sent off to, mm. to UEA. Uh, and they, they took me on. And what I, I didn't have the confidence or the ability to tackle a novel when I was at UEA. Everyone in my class was doing uh, a novel, except me, because I was so new to prose. So I started off with short stories mm. and sort of cut my teeth on those. Um, I look back on them now, you know, they're, they're not very good, um, but they were amazing to me at the time and I got a lot of encouragement from my, my tutors and my, um, my group. So I finished a collection of six short stories for my portfolio. Um, and then that gave me the confidence to try a longer piece and I wrote a novel pretty quickly after I finished the course but it was absolutely dreadful it was a thriller that didn't thrill it was uh, really bad but I learned more writing that failed novel Mm. than on any other book I've I've written that's gone on to get published Um, you know I really learnt how a novel works from the inside out Mm. Um, by writing that one and then I quickly wrote The Red Dancer after that and I don't think I could have written The Red Dancer had I not written the bad novel beforehand and that's the Matahari book that's right yeah it's it's a book about um, the life and times of Matahari 
And is it a novel? Or? It is. Yeah, we, it's a fictional biography, mm-hmm. but it's it's um, it's it's um, classed as a novel. And your other, so your own work, you've published one novel, this fictional biography. Have you, is there other stuff? Yeah, so my, my most recent book was called The Mirror, okay. which is um, two short novels in one volume. Uh, the first novel is called The Mirror, confusingly, and the second volume is called The Velvet Gentleman. Um, the Velvet Gentleman was actually written in 2002, after The Red Dancer came out, and it's... Um, it's, it's another fictional biography of this time of the life of uh, Eric Satie, the French composer, who I was a big fan of. And I sort of wrote, I wrote a, a novel about his life with him narrating his own story. And I gave it to my editor at Faber, and everyone at Faber loved it, but they just didn't know what to do with it. They just said, it's, it's quite short, it's weird, we don't know what kind of book it is, you know, we, we just don't think we can market it very well. So... It was sort of put on the back burner, uh, and I went away and did a lot of other things, and then I, I wrote The Mirror, uh, which is the first of the two short novels. And my editor, so it was about eight years later, and my editor said, you realise that you've written a companion piece to The Velvet Gentleman? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, yeah, these, these books go together. Let's put them in one volume. They work really well together. Uh, so we did. Uh, and that came out in two, 2014. So how did you move from the um, author-publisher relationship with Faber to um, creating uh, the writing a novel six-month course, which you did, I think, in 2009, and then moving on to sort of directing the fiction programme as a whole? Yeah, right. So um, it's a guy called um, Patrick Keogh who used to work here um, in 2009. Mm-hmm. And he and Stephen Page, the CEO who I was talking to earlier on, they had an idea that they returned that Faber should have a writing school, and they looked around at their authors. And I had been teaching uh, by that time at Goldsmiths on the MA there, mm. the Creative Writing MA. And in fact, I had, as part of my job at Goldsmiths, was that I had taught and run, and also convened, which means you make up the content for mm. the course, for a, a six-month course uh, for undergrads, third-year undergrads. Who created writing module who weren't doing English, so you know some of the students were quite interesting in terms of sort of musicians, and actors, mm-hmm. um, and dramatists, and um, I really cut my teeth. I did that for six years, and I, I built up a, a lot of material. So when Faber asked me if I'd like to teach one of the, the classes, I said, "That yeah, great, you know, I'd love to do that." And they said, "Well, we don't really know what we're doing, so do you think you could come up with some kind of..." content you know and I said yeah sure and so it was quite easy for me to um, to put together a six month course and I kept it quite vague you know so each week is just character dialogue voice blah 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 just so that each tutor had their own freedom to to teach that topic in any way they wanted there wasn't really a, a prescription that they had to stick to but I came up with uh, my content, and Louise Doughty was the first tutor with me, um, just the two of us, and she had her own content. Um, so the classes ran parallel, but we each taught differently, and, and the students didn't really have any uh, crossover between the, the two classes. So we, we started in February, actually, in, in 2009. That was the first class. And it went well. Uh, we only had seven students because no one knew what we were doing. Mm. Or, you know, no one knew of us. Faber Academy was so new. But we, we, um, it worked well. And one of the things I'm proudest of about Faber Academy is that that course structure hasn't changed that much in all that, this time. Um, you know, I, I did a pretty good job, I think, first off. So it, it, it sort of has stuck, really. We haven't really changed it. And so I based it on a lot of things that were going on at Goldsmiths, and it was designed to compete with MAs. So you got a similar amount of contact time with the tutors, you had your work looked at a similar amount of times, um, you know, there were guest tutors coming in as well. Um, we put an anthology of work together at the, at the end of the course, which um, the students then read from, which is something that was done at Goldsmiths. So I was able to insist on all of these things, you know, right from the beginning so that uh, the students have had the same experience, more or less, since the beginning. Um, and 
luckily I just had all of the experience um, at, Go- at Goldsmiths to be able to bring it to bear to, to favour. So the, I suppose the kind of big question here that often gets asked, not just in the context of the Faber Academy, but in all a creative writing courses is, is you know, do they work? Are they a kind of valid uh, thing? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a question that comes up again and again. Mm. Um, I think a few things to say about that. First of all, you can't put talent where there isn't any. You know, So um, creative writing courses, like any other uh, creative course, is designed to bring out the talent that's already there our job, our most important job is, is finding the right people for the course and the selection procedure here is, is very rigorous um, and we spend a lot of time on it and if it's the most important part of the process and if we can get it right it means that it'll be a pleasure for everyone um, students and tutors and I so it's more about creating the right environment for people to realise their potential as fully as possible so it's not about us putting you know, telling them stuff it's about them learning to to identify to articulate to be able to edit assist themselves and others in in writing you know and the the weekly sessions uh, where they show each other their work is really where they learn to do that Um, most of the students are terrified uh, when they start but by the end of the course they become addicted to these sessions um, because they've learned to articulate themselves, they've learned to think as editors and writers, um, and it's, it's, it's glorious to watch, actually. We're going to sort of drill down in a little bit more into the kind of the nuts and bolts of the course, but we wanted to kind of, um, we wanted you to explain kind of what the landscape of creative writing courses was like when Faber was set up, when Faber Academy was set up, and how the Faber Academy kind of fits into that kind of wider world. Yeah, so Faber is is the first um, non-academic um, personal place to offer a creative writing course, and we wanted to play to those strengths of being a publishing house rather than a, a, a university. So, for instance, Faber asked me, well, "Should we give the students some kind of certificate at the end?" And I said, "Absolutely not." First of all, that's disingenuous, and you know we're not an academic institution. And secondly, it would send out the wrong, wrong signal to the students. You know, this isn't about being getting a qualification. It's, it's about just being a very practical, hands-on course, getting your hands dirty, as it were, you know, in, in the writing. <clears throat> so at the time, obviously UEA was, was still around, um, but I know from friends of mine who'd done the course since I was on it that it, it had doubled its numbers, mm. and in fact I think it's quadrupled its numbers now. So we felt that that perhaps had been diluted a bit, the reputation of UEA. And in the meantime, by 2009, there were quite a few other MAs that were very good. So Birkbeck was one, mm-hmm. and Royal Holloway was one in London, and Roehampton. Um, and outside of London, you know, there was Warwick and Lancaster mm-hmm. were very good. Um, and, and all the American MFA programmes as well. Yes, obviously the American Idaho being the, the most famous one. So there were, um, you know, there had been a big increase in numbers, but now I, mean, I think every university, mm. I've, I've, I, as far as I'm aware, has some kind of creative writing module. So, you know, it's, it's great for writers because it's a, a way of earning a living. Um, but I know a lot of people dislike the, how prevalent creative writing has become. They think it somehow produces a, a type of writer, you know, mm. the, the, for the standard format. But I just, I know from working with Faber Academy for the last nine, ten years that that's just not true, or at least it's not true for us. You know, we we very much encourage individuality, originality. People come to us with a book in mind, and usually um, it's it's a good idea, and that's why they're here, because they, they, they know it's a good idea. And a lot of people want to read those kinds of books, you know, that are really original and different. Why, um, this is a very sort of speculative question, but the resistance to creative writing courses seems to be particularly prevalent among writers. There seems to be this real conflict between people who, who are taking jobs and um, you know, earning a living through teaching creative writing courses and the people who are also criticising. They seem to be sort of among, um, you know, coming from the, from the same group, often sometimes the same people. 
why is there this sort of internal conflict? I really don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's partly maybe a generational thing. Mm. Um, what I find is that a lot of the people who are very vocal in their antipathy towards creative writing courses tend to be a generation older than me. Uh, goodness knows why they've got such a, a bee in their bonnet about creative writing courses. You know, why on earth should you not study writing as you study music or painting? You know, it's just, it's just obvious to me that writing schools, good writing schools, can benefit writers, you know. Um, so I really don't know. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the argument is... is one now. Uh, I don't think the debate is really a very interesting or valid one anymore. I think creative writing schools, good ones, of course can help young writers, new writers to develop their talent and their, their project. I think just it's obvious to me. And you were the, the first non-academic one, but there are others now. C- uh, Curtis Brown has a programme, is that right? And there are there yes. other similar... The Guardian started one. Yeah. Um, um, they ran for about... Um, five years or so and then they closed down a year or two ago Um, and Curtis Brown yeah they started a couple of years after us I think very much with one eye on us and um, because they're an agency they they figured yeah well you know if a publishing house can can do it why can't a a literary agency and they've had some success as well Um, you know so I think we're we're the two main uh, Courses in, in London outside of academic institution, institutions, I think. You mentioned um, your admissions process and the importance of, of, of that in getting the right mixture of, of, of students. Can you talk a little bit more about exactly what that looks like at yeah. Faber and what it is you're looking for and selecting for? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we get a lot of people who, who feel um, you know, that they, they wouldn't be good enough to apply for, to us, you know, and I just want to really, you know, sort of for the record and, and uh, repeat what I say again and again to them is that it's absolutely not a level that you have to be at in order to. What's the point of having a, you know, brilliant writers come on the course if they're already brilliant, you know, they go off and write a book then in that case, you know. So, what we look for at Faber Academy is when people apply to us, we're looking for three things really. Um, they, they send a letter and a thousand words of their writing, um, and it can be any any thousand words. Um, and we can tell from pretty much a few lines, you know, of the thousand words, whether or not there's that certain something that, that we're looking for. It's very difficult to put your finger on it. It's difficult to name, but it's just you just know if somebody has got something there which which is kind of good. Um, and we're also looking for from the letter um, whether or not they, we think they would fit into a group dynamic very well um, this is the most important thing is, is the group dynamic if that's good um, and it's democratic then it'll be enjoyable for everyone and people learn best when they're having a good time so it's very important uh, that we feel that they wouldn't dominate or, or, or uh, you know uh, uh, sort of be, be difficult in, in some way and thirdly, we're looking to see whether we think they will benefit from the course, you know, whether um, we think they have things that, that they could learn. Um, I mean, everyone wants to learn, but some people surprisingly don't want to learn. Um, and we're, that's, that's what we're not looking to admit to the Academy. You know, we really want people who are keen to, to improve and, and to try new things out, experiment and play with their work. Um, and try new things. So it's those sort of three things, you know, the writing, the group dynamic, and, and whether or not we feel they will benefit from, from the course. And what are the numbers of applicants that you get for the, and the number of available places, and also what does it cost? So it's very difficult to, to give numbers because they're different each time. Um, they're different for different courses at the time of the year. Weirdly, we always get more applications for the October to March course than the January to June course, I think, because a lot of people think in academic terms that October seems to be the right time to, to study, and you know January seems a bit odder uh, as a time to start studying. Um, we get many, many more applications than we have places. Uh, that much is, has always been the case. Apart from the first one, we only had seven applicants and we had seven places. 
Um, we had a wonderful article written about us in the uh, ES magazine last year, um, which is available still online. And um, we found that our application numbers went up by about 700% after okay. that. So you're now at kind of Love Island. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, we're, we're already getting applications for October, um, and we will, they will roll in for the next few months um, so there's a lot of work now to be done during the selection procedure, sort of last all summer. But we get we get sort of you know a, a lot of applications um, and a lot more now since that article. Uh, the cost, the cost. Sorry, yeah, and the cost is four thousand pounds for the six month course. Um, when we started, the cost was three thousand pounds, and then it went up to three thousand five hundred for two years, I believe, <clears throat> and it's been four thousand. Uh, since then, so for, the, for about the last five years, which is something I'm very proud of. Uh, we could have got away with increasing um, that amount, but we haven't. We want to keep it as affordable as, as possible, whilst obviously at the same time, you know, with the understanding that we're a company and that we have to make profit just like everyone else. So we originally priced the, the course to compete with MAs, but now MAs have gone through the roof cost-wise. I think they're about nine grand now. And ours is still four grand. So we're a very cheap, affordable option now, I think, compared to, to MAs. And I'm, I'm very, very proud that we've kept our costs the same pretty much in all nine years that we've been going. The um, Facebook Academy obviously runs more than just this one course. You also have a range of sort of online and in-person courses. Can you talk a little bit more about the different courses that you offer and um, how the online courses and the in-person courses work? Yeah. So we, this is our flagship course. runs twice a year, as I said, October to March and January to June. So we have the Christmas and Easter break in the middle. But we run a lot of other three-month courses, which is the next longest after the six-month. And we have a number of tutors who do those. We have Keith Ridgeway... Rowan Coleman, Joanna Briscoe, um, Sue G, and, and lots of other people. Um, and they all do slightly different things on their course. But basically, it's, it's um, people who really have had no experience of writing at all and who want to start writing. So entry to those courses isn't selective. Um, you can just turn up. Um, and often, if we feel that someone isn't quite ready for the six-month course, we'll we'll ask them to think about doing a three-month course first and then come to the six-month course, which is, uh, which is what a lot of people end up doing. And they, they all say it's, it's kind of quite a nice pattern to, to do it like that. You, know. <clears throat> you get yourself up to speed, as it were, for the six-month course by doing the three-month course. And then in the summer we, months, we run a lot of one-week courses over the summer. Um, we have lots of tutors doing that. We have um, people like Jill Dawson and... Others, um, Catherine, I um, can't remember her surname, from Australia, comes over and does a, a week-long course for us every year. And then we have one-day courses, which, which I do, along with Joanna Briscoe. Um, up they're called Start to Write. And they're kind of like an open day. You can come along and um, try out a few writing exercises, have a bit of discussion with the tutor, and um, the tutor talks a bit about the course and so on. So we do, we do all of those courses, everything from one day to six months. And then, yes, we have an online course, which, is, um, which has been very successful, actually. We've had quite a few publication deals off the back of that. And that's run by Tom Bromley, and um, he's doing a great job for us. He's been running it for a few years now. And, in fact, um, we're also just putting a lot more content on the online course right now, this summer, as we speak. Um, so that'll be even better come October. Um, and that's very popular for obvious reasons, for people who can't make it to to the uh, face-to-face classes in London. Um, and it's, yeah, the numbers are very, very good for the online course. The online courses run exactly in, in parallel to the sort of in-person courses? No, it's not. It's, I, I don't actually have any involvement in the online course. It's, it's Tom's baby. Um, and I'm not quite sure off the top of my head what what the um, the dates for the next course are. It's it's all available on the website, obviously, all the details there. And I'm not, in fact, I'm not even sure of the cost, but obviously, it's a great deal cheaper than the physical course. Can you talk a bit about what 
what you actually cover in particular sessions, how it's divided. You were mentioning earlier chapter dialogue, and again, the book has, has similar divisions. But, but what actually happens over that six months? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> from week three, um, pretty much all the way through to the end of the course, we run um, uh, in the two-hour weekly sessions in the evenings. Uh, the second hour is given over to what we call the peer presentations or PPs for short, which is when the students show each other their work. And as I say, they're usually terrified, um, but we are very, very careful to set up a safe and secure environment for them to show work. Uh, you know, um, there's, there's a, a rule that what goes on in the room stays in the room. Uh, work can't be shown outside of the group. And each student has their work looked at twice during the course, up to 5,000 words each time. Um, but the, the students are very quickly you know, learning um, to, to assess manuscripts, offer editorial advice, uh, help to identify problems in manuscripts, um, offer solutions and alternatives, discuss ideas for development of each other's work, um, which is fantastic. You know, the amount of material that's covered in those peer presentations. So it's a little bit overwhelming, I think, for, at first for the people mm. whose work it is. Um, but people record the sessions and they can go over the recording of, uh, of having their own work discussed, which is a great idea, I think. Um, and the same order is, is rolled over in the second half of the course, so everyone gets roughly the same amount of time between their PPs to prepare for them. Um, and as I say, by the end, uh, they are absolutely addicted to those PPs. And you know, all my groups have always just carried on meeting up and showing work to each other as writing groups after the course has ended. PP is peer presentation. Peer presentation, yeah, PP is for sure. I think you know what 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 I try to say to them. Look, you know, every every writer's issue is your issue. You know, whatever you talk about in somebody else's work during these sessions you will encounter that issue yourself one day. And so the more you put into these discussions and critiques, the more you'll be helping yourself and the more input you'll be putting into your own work. Um, and a lot of people say after the course has ended that they didn't believe me when I say that at the beginning, but actually they found it to be, to be true, you know, that the more you put into those discussions, the more you get out of them. That must be... Um quite a difficult thing in some ways to control you can control the syllabus you know what ground you're going to be covering what writers presumably you'll be recommending to them and, and what things you'll ask them to look at but the alchemy of the group and the criticism that they'll receive must very much depend on um, the characters you get some people just will be better at giving feedback or more interested in giving feedback or will have very strong likes and dislikes will just not like um, a certain type of novel or a certain type of narrative and then if you're a person in that course you know how do you um, control um, for the quality of a group because that must really affect a student's experience of a course. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't force anyone to, to, to contribute if they don't want to. And of course, in every group, there, there are always people who are much more vocal than others. Um, there was one lady who went through the entire six months and I, I think didn't say a word during the, the, the peer presentations, which was quite a feat, actually. I was pretty impressed with that. Um, so... But, but everyone is listening and thinking, you know, about it. So even if you're not speaking and offering um, your opinions, you're learning. Um, I think the thing to do is, is a lot of people start off by saying, well, this isn't usually the kind of thing I would be reading. You know, it's not really to my taste, but I'd, I liked it, you know, and I liked this about it, and I thought this was working really well. So a lot of people are, are being forced outside of their comfort zones as readers which is great for them, um, because if, if the group was made up of 15 historical novelists, mm. that would be very dull. So we, one of the things we make sure to do in the selection procedure is to make sure that the group has a mix of ages and backgrounds and styles and genres, um, and we're very careful about that. You know, we make sure that there's a, a really interesting mix of, of people and, and books in there. Um, because at the end of the day, whether you're writing sci-fi or historical fiction or romance, you've got the same issues. You know, have I got enough conflict in my story? 
are my characters sort of compelling? You know, do I have enough story to, to make it into a whole novel? You know, it doesn't matter what kind of book you're, you're writing, you've still got the same basic problems of constructing a, a really brilliant narrative. And so if that's the second hour of the PPs, what's going on in, in the first hour? So in the first hour, we have the themed um, topic part, which is more of the taught element. So for that, I will have usually uh, given them um, a bit of text, a, a reading to do the week before. Uh, it's sometimes it's a short story or a chapter from a, a novel, something short. Mm-hmm. We're, we're very keen not to overload them with too much um, reading to do at home because we figure that they're supposed to be writing their books and that's the main reason they're, 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 they're here um, and we usually spend that hour thinking about the model text you know discussing it doing work in pairs and there's always a writing exercise to practice what uh, what we've been discussing and the writing exercise isn't to do with their books it's something completely discreet but it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a form of play and practice. So, um, and usually um, those, they, they love those writing exercises because a lot of people are busy. Sometimes they'll have a bad week where they haven't done much on their books. But they say, you know, it's great, Richard. I just come in and I know I'm going to do a bit of writing, uh, you know, once a week in class. And uh, that's something at least, you know. Um, and we get them writing and doing exercises right from the first week. So they're, they're sort of uh, l- writing and reading out what they've written to partners, um, which is a very important part of the process. You know, if you just write something in, as an exercise and then don't show it to anyone, um, I just think that's not good. You know, you should have some kind of feedback or you should at least have some kind of audience for it. Even if it's just for a 15-minute writing exercise, they, they love reading it out in pairs and you know they learn a lot from from that uh, that first hour one thing um that quite often comes up in um discussions of creative writing courses is a sort of um a division between the kind of the craft side of things and the commercial side of things so some people when they talk about creative writing courses talk about the sort of conversion rate to um uh to published books and they talk about you know um in, in Faber academies um uh, case, you know, the Chloe Esposito's um, Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know and sort of, you know, the kind of flagship authors, I, I guess. And then some people say, well, that's one in a million um, or perhaps not one in a million, perhaps a little bit less than that. But, you know, what you should actually be thinking about is the craft because there is no guarantee that at the end of this you'll have even finished um, the novel that you came here to finish. So where do, where do you try and position people's expectations you know, from when they begin to well, that when they'll where they'll end up um, yeah. at the end. Yeah, good question. So I think uh, one of the things that we're really good at, and one of the things that I've been really hot on ever since the beginning, is that the course should not be um, seen or, or, or thought of as a, a you know a route to publication or a fast track to publication. It's it's really about. Um, coming here and for six months of the year and really um, starting to bring out the novel that's inside you um, and starting to realise that potential and putting that novel um, into practice. So we're we're very, very keen to manage students' expectations. Um, You know, as writers in a publishing house, we're able to be honest with them about that uh, and we have three Faber staff who come in, uh, or, or industry people, I should say, including some Faber staff who come in towards the end of the course and talk to the students about the business side of things. But for the duration of the course, you know, I try, I say to them, just put that out of your mind. You know, we're not here to talk about publishing. We're here to talk about, you know, wh- how are you going to crack this scene that you're having difficulty with? You know, what, what, how are you going to develop your novel? Do you have, do, do you know what your ending is? Do you know how to get there? Let's talk about those kinds of things um, rather than, you know, how many books you're going to sell. So we, we are very, very, very hot on that. We say we're here to, to write a book, not to think about publication. Um, and to really, really, you know, bring the book out that's inside you. And in Chloe's uh, Esposito's case, she was in, in my class and she was scared of the stuff that she was coming out with. Um, she just said, it's just so violent 
you know, and it's it's so full of sex, you know, I just I'm afraid and I said, That's fantastic. You know, you're doing a great job, you're accessing the part of you which you need to access in order to you know, produce material that's compelling, that feels passionate, that people are going to be gripped by, you know, that's not censored in any way. Uh, but she took a long time to to give herself permission to do all of that and, and now look at her, you know, and there's a Hollywood movie coming out of, of Mad um, it, it soon and people have just really picked up on, on her, you know, her, her verve and her sort of vim of the, of the prose and that was something that took a while to come out while she was on the course. We never talked about publication, she never thought about publication, she was just fascinated by this character that she'd come up with and was following where the character was, was going, you know, and, and it took her to some very interesting places. So we're really, really, really uh, hot on that. I can't emphasise that enough, that we're not about publication, we're about the students realising their potential as fully as possible, and we, are, we offer structure, guidance and support for them to do that. And publication is for later. Having said that, who else has been published in your course? Well, um, of course, you know, it, it does... People do look to these things for, for a, a measure of some kind of, of success. So we've, we've had around 80 publication deals uh, in nine years, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, that's nine a year on average, which is incredible. And I've, I've been doing a lot of research, we've been doing a lot of research, and um, we're pretty sure that, that there's no one around that's, that's producing those kinds of uh, figures. So we're really proud of that. And um, um, So there's Chloe. I think our, still our most famous alumni is, is probably S.J. Watson, who was in my very first group of, of those seven that I was telling you about. He was one of those, um, you know... He, his book has sold five million copies around the world and, and obviously there was a, a movie. It doesn't get much bigger than that. Um, he still is uh, the same Steve that he was when he started the course. He often comes in and talks to the students. One of the guest slots, the first guest slot, we always make sure is a Faber Academy alumni who's been through the publication process so they can pass on their, their tips. And he loves coming in and, and uh, he's a great ambassador for us. We have Alice Feeney, whose book Sometimes I Lie is, uh, was out last year. Colette Macbeth is one of ours, who's doing very well with her crime books. And uh, Renee Knight's Disclaimer was in my group. She's just writing a screenplay for that, and that's going to be a movie as well. That's a great book. You know, um, yeah, the, the list is... And, and you're right that obviously there are people like, like the, those who, who've done well. There's Ali Land as well, Katie Kahn. They've both done well. Their, their books are both bestsellers. But, you know, for, for all of them, there are lots and lots of people who have gone into publication who have published far more quietly, but equally impressively. You know, there's someone like Laura Powell who, who wrote a book called The Uninnocent, which is fantastic, but obviously didn't sell in the same kinds of quantities as Chloe's book. Um, and, you know, lots of other very literary books that have come out, um, which are fantastic. You know, so we've got a really nice range and broad range of, of, of genres and different kinds of writer coming out of the academy. Um, at what stage do people generally um, arrive on the course? I mean, you obviously, you talked a little bit about your admissions, but do people usually have the bones of a novel sketched out or do people sometimes just have a character or do, do people just sort of say, I'm, I'm playing with a few characters, I'm not too sure if, they're even, if they even belong in the same book uh, you know at what stage is it appropriate um mm. to, to to join a, a paper course? well everyone is at a different stage you know when they arrive uh, and they're always at a different stage from each other when they leave as well so um we get everything we we get students who who have a kind of an inkling sometimes as, as little as, as an inkling of a book that they they would quite like to write Maybe they only have one or two key scenes of it, you know, and they're using the course just to explore um, and develop their idea. All the way through to some people who've written one novel which perhaps didn't work, so they've come to receive a bit more guidance for their second one. Or maybe they've written a novel and they, they want to edit it on the course um, and present it to the, to the group for review. Um, we've even had um, quite a few uh, instances, actually, uh, surprisingly, um, people who've already published novels, mm. who for some reason or another 
Sometimes it's it's that they uh, it's they've taken time off writing to raise a family. Uh, one writer, previously published writer, who came into my group, she had sort of lost her confidence a bit with with her writing and hadn't written for many years. So they were using the course to sort of get back on the horse, as it were, um, with a new project. So we get everything from previously published writers to people who haven't written anything at all before. You know, but in every case, we can always see something from their application that we like. And, you know, and as I said before, we feel that they will fit in with the group dynamic, then they're in. It doesn't matter what kind of publication record they've already had. With novelists we have on the show, we often ask them uh, whether they're plotters or plungers in terms of do they uh, lay out a schematic for how the whole book will be or just plunge in. And in the book you use a slightly different analogy of an eco versus a gusher. Could you, <laughs> could you talk about that? Sure, yes. I think, you know, one of the things that we talk a lot about at the Academy is um, it doesn't really matter how other people write, how they arrange and manage their time to write. Because um, a lot of people, if they hear that Ian McEwen gets up at 4.30 in the morning, you know, works already for two hours, they think, well, that's how I should do it then, you know, because he's a real writer. And uh, I always say, it doesn't matter what Ian McEwen does, you've just got to find the right way for you to organise your time. You know, it could be that you just love doing, like, just not getting out of bed really for a whole weekend and just writing in bed for eight hours a day for a couple of days. And you might produce 5,000 words in that time, which is fantastic, you know. Or it could be that you just like to do a little bit every day and eke it out, you know. So that's the idea of, you know, do you like to binge write or do you like to be much more mechanical about it and sort of disciplined? And that's the idea behind eco and gusher. And it has a lot of different um, terms. I've heard um, the the creator of Game of Thrones, um, what's his name? Uh, Martin. Martin. Yes, he calls it planners or pantsers. You know, so um, pants is being, you know, by the seat of your pants, mm. just winging it all the time, uh, which would be a bit like my gusher, I guess. So, yeah, lots of different, there's gardeners and architects as well, you know, people who, who tend to the garden or people who build the houses. So there are lots of different ways of talking about the same thing, which is you've got to find out what works best for you. You know, half the problem for new writers, for any writer, is managing your time well enough to get the work done. You know, it's 50% of the battle, I think, is, is um, making the time to write. Um, because we're all busy, we've got a thousand distractions going on, you know, writing a book is not an attractive prospect, you know, we'll think of anything to put us off. Um, but you've got to get your, you know, bum on that seat and, and write, and that's very difficult. I mean, on, on that note, I guess we should congratulate you, because we're actually interviewing you on the eve of the publication of your, of your new book, uh, Writing a Novel, which will sort of lift the lid on, on maybe a few of the things that you um, teach in the course. One of the things that mm. I um, have to say, I opened the book, read and realised I'd never even thought about before, which is probably a, a bit of an embarrassing admission, is the difference between a story, a plot and a narrative. <laughs> yes, so um, it's quite a tricky thing to to think about, I think, for especially, especially for new writers, you know, while well, well, story and plot are sort of the same thing, but they're not, they're, they're quite different, you know, everyone knows the story of Oedipus or Hamlet or Cinderella, but you can tell that story any number of ways, uh, and, uh, you know, e each of us would, if we were all given the task of retelling the story of Hamlet, you know, we'd all come up with a, a completely different book because we'd all have gone away and plotted the same events in completely different ways. So plotting is, is all about the decisions you make as a writer, uh, you know, how best to tell your story. So you have to, you have, to have the story straight, but you also have to know how, how, you, how much time you're going to spend telling it, or in what order are you going to tell the events, and, and so on and so forth. And we talk a lot about that in, in, um, on the course. You mentioned... Um again earlier, that very much the focus on craft. Another point that comes up about creative writing courses is that they provide a kind of entree, they provide contacts, you know, entree into a closed world in terms of literary agents or publishers or things like that. With the people who've been through your course, how have they then made that step? Do you, do you funnel them to agents or how does that, that piece work? Yes, yeah, so the anthology that I mentioned earlier on, um, we put that together about three months after the course ends so that the students go away um, and they have some time to get their 2,000 words 
which is what we ask for from them for the anthology into shape and then we put, put together a lovely anthology um, some of which is, are on that shelf there and then three months after the course ends we invite them back into the building and we invite uh, um, a whole lot of agents to come along and the students read to the uh, group of agents and you know, there's, there's a buzz around our course now, so we, we get about 50 or 60 agents who, who come along. And I know from speaking to them that they look forward to the Faber Academy reading days. There are two a year. Um, and it's part of their, their calendar now. Um, and a lot of business is done that way. So they, they get a copy of the anthology on the day. And then a week later, a PDF of that anthology goes out to the industry. So the, the agents who come on the day have a week to, to sort of browse through um, and follow up if they like anything that they see to follow up on it so the, the, the students get um, a huge amount of exposure from, from the anthology and from coming on onto our course at Faber Academy um, and you know it's a, it's a great opportunity for them to have their work looked at but you know again we're keen to manage their expectations we say look you know not everyone not, not all the agents look straight away, they sometimes they go away, they're busy, they might not, not look at the anthology for a month or, or two. So not to be disheartened if, if you don't get any you know, uh, contact from, from the anthology on the day. Some do, some don't. Um, it's not really about that, it's more of a graduation, it's a celebration, uh, and just so happens that some agents are there as well. Um, but... And, and we help tutors, we tutors help as much as we can. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the kind of pastoral care that we give the students. Um, they, they get to know each other through Twitter and through a, a reading series that I run called Vanguard, and they all come along, and I'll help when I can. And Joanna and Esther Freud and the other tutors will help when they can as well. I'll put in a good word here and there for them. Um, yeah, so we, we, we provide as much help uh, in that department as much as possible. I was following on from that, um, and it's a bit of a more of a, an industry-wide question, but you've mentioned, we talked a little bit um, about money throughout the interview, you mentioned sort of being very, very um, broke um, in, in parts of your career, and it seems at the moment there's a lot of discussion around um, where the money is, is piling up in the industry. You know, it seems the publishers have, have been having quite a few good years, um, while authors' earnings seem to be sliding. So the commercial reality of, of being a writer, being a novelist, seems to be getting worse rather than better. Are there answers that can be found in you know, the taking of, of writing novel more seriously and perhaps um, hopefully killing the trope of the, of the you know, struggling novelist um, starving in, in the garret? I just have to say that, you know, we're, we're really hot on encouraging the students not to write for money. You know, it's just, it's, it's not going to produce, I believe, um, good work. You know, if you're, if you're writing deliberately to, to try and, you know, um, make a marketable book, um, that's not what publishers, good publishers, uh, are looking for. They're looking for passion and beauty, um, you know, and originality. But the two aren't books. mutually exclusive. No, they're not. Um, and writing for money and writing a marketable book are not quite the same thing. No, but I think, um, I mean, we, we don't concentrate on marketing or, or you know, the, the, the marketplace end of things. That, that's for, for agents to discuss with them. Um, but it's really just about writing a story that they want very much, very badly to tell. Um, and usually, you know, the, the stories that are bursting to be told are, are, are bursting for some very good reasons. You know, they're usually very compelling stories. Um, like Laura Powell's stories is very compelling, but Chloe's is as well. You know, but one is much more commercially successful than the other. Um, so it's just not something that we, we talk a lot about at the Academy. Um, you know, whether a book is marketable or not. It's really not part of our language. Do you talk about um, how people can set up, how people can live as writers? Not really, no. We, you know, we, we're, just, we're here to talk about the book that they want to write and to help them achieve that as much as possible. Um, we do, you know, at the end of the course, we talk about next steps. There's, there's a session that we 
you know, where we, we say, right, you know, get a website together, get onto Twitter, you know, start following some publishers, start entering some competitions and that kind of thing. Um, but it's very difficult to make your living as a writer. And as, as you just quite rightly said, you know, very, I, I don't know any writers who don't, doesn't, who don't have some kind of secondary source of income, you know. I mean, everyone uh, has a job. Journalism, reviewing, teaching, or manuscript assessment, or commercial writing, something because you know, making a living solely as a novelist is, is very, very, very hard these days. Uh, and there are obviously uh, lots of exceptions, but for all of those exceptions, um, you know, there are many, many more who are struggling, um, and it's and it's hard. It's it's hard to survive as a as a novelist solely as a novelist, and we we try to make them aware of that. You know. I have one, one other question. I was reading a piece about the poetry world once, which was talking about the MFAs in poetry and how it talks about how in, in a lot of writing genres, the big dream is that you, you, know, you write a bestseller, it's made into a movie or anything like that. You, know, you can make a lot of money, but that's never going to happen in poetry. And so in the poetry world, the big dream is you like, write a collection that gets you a job teaching on an MFA program. And do you think that there's, is there a potential that we could get to a circularity where like, the payoff of being a novelist is that you get work teaching as a novelist, that it all becomes a kind of slightly self-consuming circle like that, that that's how the career as a writer is, if it becomes about um, I mean, I think a lot of writers uh, do want to teach yeah. on creative writing mm-hmm. courses. Uh, you know, I did, mm-hmm. and I really, really enjoy it. You know, it's, it's, it's great... Um, it's a great job to have. You kind of, it's you're still involved in writing in some way. You know, you don't have to work at Tesco's or something. So it's, it's, it's a great job, and, and jobs are, are sought after. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think as long, you know, I think. So do you mean that it's sort of di- going to dilute their work or something? No, that just it might it might become this kind of circular thing where you go on a creative writing course in order to sell a novel, in order to teach another creative writing <laughs> course. Um, I've never thought of it like that. I think. Uh, a lot of writers don't want to teach on creative writing courses, um, but still have done a creative writing course. So, no, I, I don't think that's. I think some people just enjoy that kind of work and that kind of contact, and others just prefer the isolation and you know, uh, not really that into, you know, being asked to draw on on their own experiences of as a. As a writer, you know, I think a lot of people pre- like to preserve that and for their own work. And it's just just different courses for different horses, I guess. Well, thank you so much for your time, and the best thank of you. luck with the publication of your book. Thank you very much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that. Now, the update from us, Simon. Uh, I have been going over copy edits for my book, which is uh, exciting, although I have quite weird feelings about how it will feel like when it's actually finished and doing some magazine work. Weird feelings? Yeah, mixed and strange feelings. But um, there's more important news from your side, Cassia. What's going on? Uh, There's two bits of news. So we are recording this on... Um, the Friday before my book comes out which is very exciting Um, but and that's very happy news for me at least Um, but there is also devastatingly sad news again probably more from my side than yours uh, which is that this will be my final um, episode as co-host of Always Take Notes which I'm very sad about Um, and we will be introducing our new host in the next episode Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Cassie Sinclair. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Zara Hankir handles our social media. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and James Edgar handles our graphic design. You can find us on all manner of social media. Our website is alwaystakenotes.com. You can find us on Twitter at, all, at Take Notes Always, and on Facebook and Instagram at always take notes and if you've enjoyed the show please do consider leaving a review on uh, itunes it really helps or contributing to our crowdfunding page at patreon.com slash always take notes thank you very much for listening and goodbye